Today at Hingham High School, we have a guest speaker talking about alternative transportation called J-Pods to, uh, uh, to reduce the use of fossil fuels within the world. Okay, and his name is Mr. Bill James. He is the founder and president of J-Pods. All right. Okay. All right. I mean, anytime we have questions, please raise your hand and ask a question right then, okay? Because I have a really short attention span, so if you ask it when we're there, we'll probably get to it. All right. How many of you have seen this commercial? car that gets 50 miles per gallon do for the environment? Not nearly as much as the car that's carrying it. Our trains can move a ton of freight, 423 miles, on one gallon of fuel. CSX, how tomorrow moves. Okay, so the question that we came up with is, if we know we can move a ton at 400 miles per gallon, why do we move a person at 18? All right? We can build these little ultralight railroads. It has never been more clear that we need to create cleaner, faster, safer, and more affordable transportation systems. We need to build those systems so they're not subject to the same congestion as automobiles, and so that we can use the infrastructure to collect the energy to power them. We need to integrate them into existing infrastructure. Infrastructure needs to apply to both cities and suburban areas so that people can get from where they are to where they need to be. They need to apply to both passengers and cargo. We need to integrate into existing mass transit systems. In this case, by the time the train unloads, a third of people are already leaving in their j -Pi. By the time the next train arrives, everyone has departed the station. The more we build these networks up, and the more we distribute out the ability to get from where you are to where you want to be, on your schedule, the less congestion we will have. Stations can also be built on multiple tiers. Riding inside the vehicle is safe and secure. We want to go to the office. Now what do we do? Okay, so we press on that. The brains of the J-Pod is an onboard computer search engine that lets passengers tell it where to go. Search for restaurants, find the one you want, click on it, and then the car knows to take you to the closest station. James describes it as a physical internet that runs on rails instead of wires. James claims his vision of a 140-mile network of rails in the Twin Cities could carry 100,000 J-Pods and save 600,000 car trips each day. It would eliminate congestion as we know it. Okay, that was four years ago. That was a Fox News story from four years ago. We're still trying to get permission to cross a road to build a network in the U.S. I've been to China four times in the last year, and we've got permission to build in China already. So, and I'm going to Qatar in the Middle East in about three weeks to build, to come to a, do a presentation for the royal family in Qatar relative to building out the city of Doha for the 2022 World Cup Games so that this will be the means of transportation for that city. And um, if you look at JPods, if you go to jpods.com, you can look up any of this stuff and keep track of it. If you guys want to set up a website about building this in Hingham and building it in the Boston area, I will help you. If you guys want to and put together a group, these are the little robots. That's actually the brain that runs them. This is, of course, is, is a little wheel set, but I'll show you what the full-size things look like. But if you learn to program these and write this stuff and manage this stuff, or if you can do graphics and artwork or come up with designs for vehicles, all of that sort of thing is available and open. And one of the things that I would like you guys to walk out of here with is we're going to form what we call a local mobility company that will own and operate the networks in the South Shore. 
And if you're interested in working for one of those companies, you can get founder shares by helping form this company and operating it. And those founder shares are free, but you have to exchange work, which is part of the sounds. So one of the really strange things about what I'm going to show you here is it's like the internet in about 1984 or computer industry at about that same time where anybody that wanted to participate in this stuff, all they had to do was start doing it and they shortly became the experts in it because nobody knew how to program software for personal computers. Nobody knew how to do all this stuff. So the people who jumped in and started became the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates of the world. Okay? And the size and the scale of this thing is as significant as is the internet. Um, essentially, from my perspective, where we got in infrastructure trouble was mobilizing to fight World War I. We locked in the great innovations of those days of Ford, Edison, Bell, and the Wright brothers. So we had a century of rotary telephones followed by radical innovation now where every kid walks around the shoe phone. Okay? And you guys probably have another shoe, shoe phone joke for you. Get smart, you had a shoe phone. Anyway, so it works really well on older audiences. Um, but nobody in 1984 would have guessed that almost everybody was walking around with a camera and a phone in their pocket all the time. So that is a radical shift in infrastructure since 1984. We can make a similar radical shift in infrastructure in both power and transportation by changing the fundamental infrastructure of the networks. We're going to change from cars, from moving a ton to move a person on our highway network, and we're going to change the electrical grid from being electrical to chemical, I think. Here's a great quote from Edison. And there's a, it's much longer than this. I chopped it down. But in 1910, he looked at it and said, sunshine and electricity to him looked a lot the same. He says, do we use it? He says, oh no, we burn wood and coal like renters burn the front fence. We live like squatters, not like we own the property. And he, in 1934, he was talking to Henry Ford and Firestone and said, solar is the way to go. Yet we tend to think of sunshine as being too thin to be used, and Edison did not. What we needed was, and what he laid out was, we needed a way to store and manage it. And that we've come up with, I think. But maybe not. Maybe you guys can think of a way to come up with it. But I'll give you my ideas, and then you can look at it and say, OK, here's ways that I can build on those ideas. Um, how many of you have seen these solar race cars that run across Australia or up and down Canada? All right. They average 90 kilometers an hour, which is about 55 miles an hour, off of a solar collector two meters by three meters long. All right. If you count out the math and say, OK, 55 miles an hour, two seconds apart, that equates to 50 meters. And we put those collectors over the top of our rails, we're gathering 17 times the energy that allows those solar race cars to go 55 miles an hour. So there's plenty of energy. Every hour of every day, enough solar energy hits the earth to power all human economies for a year. We just have to be clever enough to live with it, OK? And we can be. Here's what we've come up with so far. Is when I put these solar collectors over the top of my rails, I'm gathering about five megawatt hours per mile per day. So that's a, a lot of electricity. But managing that electricity is hard. So what we did, and you can't push it. Like the core part of our group all studied nuke engineering together at West Point. And in a nuke plant, you have a big center, and you can waste a lot of energy pushing it out to the edges. With solar, they behave a lot like leaves or wind machines. They act like leaves on a tree, not like a miniature coal plant. So you can't push the energy very far. So what we do is we run it and run it right to a pole and electrolyze the water so we get hydrogen and oxygen. But hydrogen is unbelievably fluffy and hard to manage. So what we do is run that past carbon dioxide and you end up with methane. And methane is the key component of natural gas. How many of you have a gas range or a gas furnace in your house or a fireplace? All right? We're really good at handling natural gas. So my guess is in 20 years, you will not have electricity coming into your house from outside. 
you'll have three pipelines coming in. One carrying oxygen, one carrying natural gas, or methane, and one returning carbon dioxide back out to be reprocessed. And when your refrigerator wants electricity, it will tell your co-generator, which is a generator with a furnace, basically, and it will kick in and generate the electricity, and the waste heat will heat your water and heat your space. So basically, we're going to make warm-blooded buildings. So these are mitochondria, as opposed to having a, a coal-fired or a new plant that has to dump its waste heat into the atmosphere. Now your waste heat is going to do economic work in your house. And that's how we save an enormous amount of energy. And that's what this whole grid will be back about, is this distributed grid. And we'll use the JPOD networks to build that distribution grid. Um, one of the books, I read two books about the same time, nothing like it in the world, how the Transcontinental Railroads got built, and Outliers. And what it pointed to me is transportation is the catalyst for changing energy systems. In the late, in the 1860s to 1910, railroads changed the energy system from fossil fuels, or from biofuels, hay and wood, to coal and oil. When we build this transportation system, I think it will be the catalyst to change from fossil fuels to living within a solar budget. How many of you are concerned about climate change? Okay. How many of you know about peak oil? Okay, I'm going to show you peak oil. Basically, you're already experiencing. How many of you noticed gas prices went up? All right, this is all part of peak oil. Energy is going to become so expensive that fewer and fewer, fewer people are going to be able to live well within the framework that we currently have. And we are going to have to change. We have no choice. I look at it as both civilization killers are both peak oil and climate change are civilization killers. They're going to drive us back into the Stone Age if we don't adapt to them. And climate change is going to kill us deader by changing the, the nature of our environment. But peak oil is going to kill us first. Okay? My, when I'm talking to politicians about this and I'm getting resistance, which is pretty often, um, we are going to make a choice, and I think it's going to be a choice in the next 12 months, the choices that we make, and they will play out over the next 20 years. One of two things will be set in motion. We will become self-reliant, and a good example of that is we'll reduce energy per passenger mile by 85% approaching railroads. Or we will stay in what we are currently doing, and nature will reduce the number of passengers by 85%. And I think it's going to be that that kind of severity. You can start to see it in Egypt right now. Okay, here's how we I design that. Can speak the fastest possible. Okay. So, you a of so I've gone around the world and picked up a bunch of smart guys and girls that are that the work on this stuff. And this is a program written by no, Chris out of Greece. There is a big variety of statistical results available. For example, I can see that during simulation there were about 1,400 vehicles used. They traveled about 150,000 kilometers. 85% of them was with passengers. That means that the average load factor was about 47%. Very good indeed if you compare that with mass transit. I can also see how heavy each line was used. This way I can detect passenger bottlenecks. And you guys However, the most important feature is time and design these networks Let's say, and here here. Then I need 10 minutes or less to go to the green areas, 10 to 20 minutes to go to the yellow areas, and 20 to 30 minutes for the red. What if I was here? There it is again, with calculations including working time, ticketing, trip time and waiting delays as measured during simulation. Here is the time map for this network. A person in the center can, can access almost all of the Athens metropolitan area in about 20 minutes. This result clearly shows that PRT is very efficient and dramatically faster compared to conventional mass transit. So, this is a program you can download and you can design these networks. And if you get really good at these things and you can make a network that we can use to actually build networks, I'll give you equity in the companies that build those, and you can have jobs doing this stuff. It's going to be pretty interesting, because, like I said, nobody knows how to do this yet. And if you can write the software that can design these networks so that 
Um, I'll show you some stuff in SketchUp and Google Earth so that you could use Google Earth to lay the network out and it would cost it and, build, and show how it's all built. It would be really helpful. All right, here's also, this pod right here is Oli's out of Poland. This is stuff at Vectis in, in Uppsala, Sweden. And here's our little pod that we built in my garage and it runs in this rail. And then here's what they'll look like when they're prettier and built up. Here's the idea for a hull is if we connect Fantastic Junction to the town, we could basically make it so that you would not have to own a car to live in Hull. And hang them the same way as you tie the shopping, you tie where people live to where they need to go to work. And all of that can be designed and built. But somebody needs to build it. Here's an example of this rail built in SketchUp. How many of you are familiar with SketchUp? You can download a free copy from Google. All right? And then you can make up models. And if you look at the warehouse, this is in the warehouse up at, up at uh, uh, SketchUp. You can download it, and you can build out all of Hingham. So you can build Hingham in three dimensions. And then we can run the rails to it. It would be really cool. People can understand it. People can't. People have a hard time understanding things they can't see. So if you can put things in a graphical way that people can see it, incredibly valuable. And you guys are more talented than, or you're as talented as anybody, because nobody has great talent at this yet. Here's a network that we're working on right now with, uh, in New York to connect LaGuardia Airport up to the train stations at Shea Stadium. And here's a network I've laid out for Oakland. Here's where we've got an agreement to build in China, to build out that whole complex. China is very curious. They're very aggressive. We've got to get our butts moving to keep up with these guys. Because these guys work very hard, and they're very smart. We can work really hard, and we're very smart, too. All right, here's the Space and Rocket Center, where we have an agreement to build this in amongst those rockets, which will be pretty fun, I think. There's no payback. I can't figure out the economics of that, uh, except for I want to do it. All right. Here's what pays for all of this stuff. How many of you drive cars? How many of you are over 16? Okay. How many of your families have more than one car? Okay. The average family in the U.S. spends about $10,300 a year on transportation. In a few places like Washington, D.C., where there's 12% access to transportation as a service, the metro, they have an extra thousand dollars of disposable income. There's that many fewer car payments. In New York City, where there's access to the subway, 31%, they have an extra $2,500, so basically a car payment a month. All right? When we build j Plus out to 70% density, so in Hingham you would not have to have a car. You'd be within walking distance of everywhere in town. And logistics moves on this, then basically your family would have about $5,000 extra disposable income a year which is really pretty significant. How many of you guys can use an extra five grand a year? <laughs> this is Dr. Chu, who is now the Secretary of Energy, when he was at Livermore National Lab. Here's sources and uses of energy. All right? Here is oil. This green thing down at the bottom, 80% of oil energy goes directly to waste. All right? And that assumes 20% is usable by their calculations, and that assumes, and they were assuming cars, which assumes that moving a ton to move a person is useful. I think you challenge that assumption, and that's one of the good things about being a teenager, is you're supposed to challenge assumptions. All right? So you're supposed to look at the world and say, why does it have to be that way? So when we challenge this assumption, and we say, why can't we be as efficient as freight rail that moves 400 ton miles per gallon? You find out we're less than 3% efficient. I think this drives climate change. All right? Because energy does work somewhere. It's neither created nor destroyed. So we've got a, the laws of thermodynamics. And all of this energy, you see electricity right here, generation? Two thirds of energy goes directly to waste. All right? So all of these things, our systems are just bizarrely wasteful. That's because we locked in on them based upon 19, World War I level of concepts. And think about the internet. You couldn't use your cell phone with a copper wire analog network. 
we can't operate within a solar budget on a highway network and the electrical grid. When we change those networks out, the profits of this is about the same things that we can get out of this by cutting this in half is the equivalent of about 230 billion gallons of gas a year. Okay? So if you count it at $3 a piece, that all adds up to being real money. Okay, that's almost a trillion dollars of, of potential profit a year by shifting infrastructure networks. And that's just the first iteration. That's not even being really clever. Here you can see the impact that oil's having on your family right now. In 2002, gas was about 45 a gallon. By 2006, it was 292, and right now I think it's 315. I think I got some gas this morning. All right. So that took $2,000 out of your family's disposable income. So you might not have noticed it, but your parents did. Okay. But it happened over time, so it squeezes less disposable income. Everything gets tighter. Fewer vacations, a lot of sort of stuff. So. What we need to do is we are never going to get oil to be cheaper because it's going to get a lot worse than this because of peak oil. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. World crude oil production peaked in 2005 at 74 million barrels a day. It is never going to get much above 74 million barrels a day and is probably going to start depleting at about 6.8% per year. So there will always be less energy from oil in the future, in your future, okay? And so if you want to have a better life, fundamentally, life requires energy. Less affordable energy, less life, okay? More efficiency, more life. It's just going to be that brutally simple. And we've been plateauing since 2005. And now we're starting to go down. And the military has issued a warning to military commands. This is General Mattis before he took back over for Central Command, which is he's controlling the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq right now. This is when he was the commanding general at Force, Forces Command. By 2012, all spare capacity in the world will be gone. By 2015, 10 million barrels a day short. Last time this happened, we had wars of the of resource wars and depression. So it's going to get very, very difficult. Here's the guys that are supposed to warn us about energy problems. It's the IEA, the International Energy Agency, and the Energy Information Administration of the U.S. government. And they show that supply will meet demand. That's what this is showing. But see what they say it's going to fill it in with? It's going to be filled in with oil fields yet to be found and oil fields yet to be developed. So as long as you can eat food that's yet to be grown, you're going to do just fine. But if you have to eat food that is already on the shelf, then this is a problem, which is exactly what you see unfolding in Egypt right now, is people who are hungry enough that they're destabilizing governments. And you're going to see it hit Mexico, my guess is, sometime this fall, uh, maybe a year from this fall, but Mexico is going to start to destabilize in a rather catastrophic way. Mexico is our third largest oil supplier to the U.S. But if Egypt closes the Suez Canal, where do people, where do you guys on the East Coast get your gas from? You know? Gas station, I know. Uh, you get it from France. Okay? When the French go on strike in September, last September, you guys almost had gasoline shortages here in Christmas time. And I'll show you the graph if you want to see it. My guess is the French have strikes planned for April and March and April over the higher food prices. If those strikes affect gas being put out, you guys can have gasoline outages by summer. How many expect to see $4 gas this summer? How many expect to see five? I'm not sure about five, but it, because I think gasoline, when it gets at a certain level, starts crushing jobs and crushing the economy. Like in 2000, you know that graph I showed you the, with the $1.45 and the 292? I used that when I was briefing Senator Obama's staff and Senator McCain's staff in July 2008 before the election on this peak oil stuff. 
and they thought that they could manage the foreclosures were not a problem. And then in September, the banking system collapsed because of foreclosures. So oil, when it gets at a certain price, starts to have other things like foreclosures collapsing the economy so that it destroys the demand. So it's, the bad side is that in the next 20 years, here's 100 years of oil, all right? It's going to follow this bell curve, all right? Plus, we have one other problem called net energy. How much energy do you get out relative to the energy that you require to get? It? So, like ethanol, everybody's familiar with ethanol? It has a one to one. So you basically get a barrel of, oil, of ethanol for every barrel of natural gas or oil that you consume to produce it. So there's no net energy. Back in the 1900s, you could take a pipe and shove it in the ground in North Texas and get a 50,000 barrel a day gusher. Now we have to send out ships into the middle of Gulf of Mexico, go five miles under the surface of the water to the surface of the ocean, and then eight miles below that to go get oil that we then spill rather noticeably with the BP oil spill. So we are pushing the safe understanding of our technology and our administrations to go desperately get more oil. That takes a lot more work to get. So let's see, you guys are 16 to 18, right? When by the time you're 20 years from now, we will have less than 5% of the usable and oil energy available to live on. So that means that in this next 20 years, we are either going to have a really miserable time, or we're going to get creative and live on a tenth the energy we currently live on. Because oddly enough, my parents and grandparents living in this time did just fine. Okay? So the world function, life developed within a solar energy budget. Most civilizations develop within a solar energy budget. It has really been in my lifetime that we have used 95% of all the oil that's ever been used by humanity has been used while I've been alive. So the world functioned well before that, it can function well again. And what's gonna pay for it is, uh, when you look at changing a paradigm, you need to create 10 times benefit. So electric cars don't really change that benefit. They're, they, they don't solve moving a ton of moving person. You've gotta have 10 times the benefit. So j bonds use a 10, cost 14 times less, Tends to build thousands of times safer. In terms of safety, your parents would not let you ride on a roller coaster with the safety record of an automobile. When this, when this system was put in Morgantown, West Virginia, as a solution to the 1975 oil market, and by the way, this is a, the first, it's a robotic system, it's all a computer network, it's a PRT system. It has delivered 110 million injury-free, oil-free passenger months.